Hello, Impact. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. And peace be unto all of us. Got a call through our president, Salam. Let's give him a hand tonight. Tonight, I want to talk about the demand or the need for, for, a, for moral clarity in the midst of our moral crisis. Impact has been taking on the crisis for some 17 years. White supremacy and white nationalism is alive and well. It's not about statues. It's about the statutes and policies that precipitate and embolden what happens in a place like Charlottesville. Now, when you understand this, my Muslim brothers and sisters, we understand racism is not about interpersonal relationships. It's not about whether you have a black friend or Muslim friend or Latino friend. Race, systemic racism is about policy. And so when any politician says to you, I'm not a white nationalist or a white supremacist, you have to say, well, let's look at the record, the voting record. Let's look at where you line up. We ought to pray tonight for that church in Sutherland, Texas. 26 people dead, the last count. But what hurts me is one racist <clears throat> killer driving a car through a crowd of people in Charlottesville can do his ugly deed Brother Priest, he's not called a terrorist. One white individual can shoot 50 some odd people in Las Vegas and wound another 500. He's not called a terrorist. One misguided person can misuse or claim, to claim and misuse Islam, the religion of peace, and he's called a terrorist. That, my friends, is systemic racism. Donald Trump is the perfect example of white privilege. Can you imagine a tape coming out on Obama that he grabbed women? Can you imagine Obama lying once and getting caught? Can you imagine that? What we are seeing is white privilege at work. What you are seeing now is because of a way of thinking that has been cultivated for 50 years. Somebody said, We've never done this before. We've never elected anyone like this before. Really? Really? Did you know that in 1877, a president got elected who lost the popular vote? If you understand this history, you understand that what we're seeing now is not something new. Tragically, it is a part of the American project. And we have a moral crisis because systemic racism is still alive. And what should concern us most is not that Trump won, but the ease at which he was able to use a deadly and poisonous concoction of Islamophobia and anti-immigrant and racism to win in the 21st century. Systemic poverty is a moral crisis. One third of our nation is either poor or working poor, one third one third. We have 14 million poor children in this nation 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And we could solve 60% of that problem tomorrow if we just took 2% of the federal budget and used it in programs that work. We have 62 million people in this country that make less than $15 an hour. We have 400 families in America that make an average of $97,000 an hour while we are locking people up who simply want 15 in a union. According to the Mailman School of Public Policy, 250,000 people die every year from poverty. That's more than die from heart attacks and strokes and diabetes. And we have poverty not because there's a scarcity of resources, because there's a scarcity of will. We have resources. 
If we didn't have resources, how could we find $3 trillion to fight a war in Iraq that we should have never gone in in the first place? We have the resources. Right now, we're in the middle of a tax plan, and I love what Impact Statement has done because you all have the right message. Nobody's talking about how this tax plan will hurt the poor. Healthcare ought to be a human right and not a right determined from Congress to Congress and president to president. When they say entitlement program or undeserving entitlement program, that's racial code word. That means those black and brown people and some poor white people that don't deserve this. And that's code language making people think that their hard times are based on other people getting free stuff from the government, which is not true. The reality is there are eight million more poor white people in this country than there are black people. There are five million more poor white people than there are Latinos. The reality is that the top 10 poorest states are the reddest states. People that vote for candidates that promise them Islamophobia, that promise them a hatred of gay people, that promise them prayer in the schools, that promise them the, uh, a hatred of immigrants, and they vote on those issues, they get in office because of racialized voter suppression, and then they use their power to pass economic policies that hurt the very people that voted for them. The reality today is we have to have a movement that says to people, if you're black and can't pay your light bill, and if you're white and can't pay your light bill, and if you're brown and can't pay your light bill because you do not make a living wage, because you do not have basic necessities, the truth of the matter, we're all black in the dark. So we need to learn how to come together. And when you have now a narcissistic egomaniac as the commander in chief, on top of the war economy's thirst for money, that is a dangerous consideration. The US has been at war with terrorism for 16 years and it has made it a war on brown people. But we're killing lots of people in lots of country and somehow terrorism is doing just fine. We need to find a better way. Hate cannot drive out hate, neither can violence just drive out violence. Now ask yourself the question, what will make us safer? Jobs, education, health care, and infrastructure, or more years of war and war and war? We could alleviate hunger worldwide for $30 billion a year. We could provide clean drinking water around the world for $10 billion a year. It is immoral that we're continuing to find more ways to cre create the mother of all bombs rather than find a way to take care of Mother Earth and lift up the people on Mother Earth. It is a moral crisis that our communities are being militarized as the Pentagon provides free access to military weapons and equipment left over from Washington's wars to local police forces, which are supposed to protect us. All these military weapons are now in the hands of the citizenry. We are militarizing our citizenry, and we have people walking in churches with military rifles just today, killing 20, 26 people. We've never not had enough money what we've not had is a moral capacity to face what's wrong with our democracy. Not one hour of debate on systemic racism. Think about that. Not one hour of debate on voter suppression that really is what helped to create this election. President Trump won, they say, by 30,000 votes in Wisconsin. There were 250,000 votes suppressed in Wisconsin. Not one hour on Islamophobia. Not one hour on the war economy. Not one hour on poverty. But we were talking about tweets and innuendos and emails. That's a crisis when your political conversation is not evolving but devolving. That is a crisis. That is a crisis. We must add to our list of maladies Christian nationalism, so-called conservative religion, and right-wing religions. First of all, there's no such thing 
as Christian, well, white, white evangelicalism or right wing. I don't talk about left religion and right religion. I talk about the prophetic moral center. And in the letter I wrote to all of them, along with other clergy, we cannot simply pray P-R-A-Y over people or presidents while they are praying P-R-E-Y-I-N-G on the poor and the vulnerable among us. That is a form of heresy that is irreligious. Every great religion tells us that the deepest values are caring for the poor, the sick, the marginalized, the immigrant, the stranger. And that form of religion, civil religion, my brothers and sisters, that props up oppression is nothing but slaveholder religion regurgitated in the 21st century. That's all it is. Slaveholder religion justified slavery for 250 years in this country. That kind of religion is nothing but the same religion that the preachers had when they came to Dr. King in the Birmingham jail and told him to be quiet and wait. But this kind of public square faith is not representative of the deep moral callings of Islam and Judaism and Christianity. I believe that the Quran says in one place, the believers, both men and women, are in charge of and responsible for one another. They all enjoin in the doing of what is right, and they must forbid the doing of what is wrong. <laughs> Ezekiel 22 says, your politicians are like wolves, prowling and killing and rapturously taking whatever they want, and your preachers cover up for the politician by pretending to have received visions and special revelation. They say this is what God says when God has said no such thing. Extortion is rife, robbery is epidemic, the poor and the needy are abused, outsiders and immigrants are kicked around at will and have no access to justice because your politicians and your preachers are saying things that God has nothing to do with. And when I hang around and meditate on that brown-skinned Palestinian Jew named Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, 18, his first sermon, not his second, third, fourth sermon, but his first sermon, the sermon that is, the, is this normative preaching that sets the theology for everything else we as Christians are supposed to believe. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has chosen me to preach good news to the poor. And the word poor there is a Greek word, patokos, which means those who have been made poor through economic exploitation and colonism. He has sent me to announce pardon to the prisoner, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burden and the battered free and to announce that this is the year for everybody to be accepted regardless of their race, their color, or their gender. That is the Jesus I follow and I do not know the other one. The reality is from the Quran to the Hebrew scriptures to the New Testament, anything less than this biblical witness for justice and love and mercy is a heretical attempt to hijack faith and use it in the service of domination and oppression. It is an abdication of a basic responsibility of faith. It is theological malpractice, a faith that says nothing and let alone does nothing. While people are treated like things and corporations are treated like people is a heretical form of hypocrisy. It is theological malpractice to say that the only issues we ought to be concerned about is hating gay folk and hating Muslim and, and being against abortion and being for prayer in the school and being for property rights and trying to make Jesus a founding member of the NRA. The only way you can get to that kind of faith is it has to descend from slaveholder religion. That's the only way you can be so loud on the things that God is so quiet on and so quiet on the things that God is so loud on. We must have moral descent because our deepest faith traditions and constitutional traditions have been hijacked too often to serve greed and racism and lies. And because of that, we must raise our voice like the prophets and cry loud and spare not and declare that in this moment, silence for us is not an option. We've got work to do in this nation that's bigger than a tweet, bigger than another email, and bigger than just signing your name on the next petition. Do all of that. But we must love this nation enough to take a knee. And by the way, how can, I, I've been raising this question, how in the world can people criticize folk for taking a knee when taking a knee is one of the most sacred religious positions in all the world? Muslims take a knee, Christians take a knee, Jews take a knee. 
We all ought to take a knee, and then from our knees, we ought to stand up and challenge injustice. I said to somebody the other day, they said they were criticizing me and said, well, you dishonoring the flag. No, I'm not dishonoring the flag when I take a knee. I'm honoring God when I take a knee. I'm humbling myself before the almighty God. But secondly, you can stand up and put your hand across your heart and dishonor the flag because the blue part of the flag stands for justice. And that's why all the stars are inside the big blue broad area. It means that until there is justice in all 50 states, then, then, then we really are not honoring the flag. So you can stand up and sing the national anthem and still be degradating what the flag is supposed to be standing for until we are one nation indivisible with liberty and and justice for all. We must love this nation enough to stand between the ICE agent who has been ordered to do wrong and the immigrant neighbor. We must dare to stand up as Christian and Jews and say, we too are Muslims. You will not isolate our Muslim brothers and sisters. If you come for them, you got to come for us too. We don't have to despair because our foremothers and sisters took on things worse than we take, we've taken on. I know they say Trump is bad, but Trump is not worse than 250 years of slavery. And I come from people who came made it out of slavery. Trump is not worse than the trail of tears that Native Americans, Native, the natives had to go through. I also come from a Tuscarora tribe and some of those natives that made it through that. Trump is something, but Trump is not as bad as some of the things many Muslims have already faced well before him. Those are all moral issues, not left versus right or Democrat versus Republican, but it's about what's right versus what's wrong. We need a movement. We need to come together. Did you know that the same people that are Islamophobic are also against gay people? And the same people that are against gay people are against public education, most of the time. The same people against public education are against living wages. And the same people against living wages are against immigrant rights. And the same people against immigrant rights are against health care for everybody. And the same people that are against health care for everybody are against the fair tax plan. And the same people that are against the fair tax plan are, are against curtailing the proliferation of guns. My point is, my brothers and sisters, if they are cynical enough to be together, we've got to be smart enough to come together. <laughs> what if we weren't just cursing the darkness, but offering up a plan? What if we would come together? Can you see a sea of religious leaders, people of faith, poor people, not doing it for the poor, but with the poor? What if we for 40 days could launch a movement, not end a movement? We must come together, not to save a party, but to save the soul and the heart of this nation itself. We don't need to have another commemoration, what they did 50 years ago, what they did 60 years ago, unless we are going to reimagine it and reconsecrate consecrate it and re-engage it in the times in which we live. Because my brothers and sisters, too much blood, too many tears, and too much sweat has been put into trying to make America a more perfect nation, and we cannot give on, up on this democracy, not now, not ever. There's some scriptures that Muslims and Jews and Christians honor. One is the Psalms. And in the Psalms it says, the stone that the builders rejected can become the chief cornerstone. Are there any people in here who have felt rejected sometime? You felt looked down on because you're black, or looked down on because you're Muslim, or looked down on because you're Jew, or looked down on because you're a woman, or looked down on because you're gay. Well, the Bible says if the stones that the builders reject come together, then those stones become a builder of a new cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. I believe that if the stones of this nation come together, we can shift them all there. Can you imagine Wolf Blitzer having to go on CNN and say, breaking news out of California. There's an imam and a rabbi and some Christian ministers and some Sikhs and some Hindus and they're hooked up with some poor folk and they're going in the state house of, wait a minute, the same thing is happening in Mississippi. Now I just heard it's happening in Alabama and it's happening all at the same time, simultaneously, the same agenda, the same points. It would force the narrative to shift. Every news outlet would have to report it. I know precisely the extent of your violations, nation. It could be, this could be talking to America. I know the enormity of your sins. You as a nation bully 
right living, and humble people. You take bribes on the right and the left, and you kick poor people when they're down. I need some people, God says, who will seek good and not evil and cause this nation to live. You talk about the God of the angel armies being your best friend. You sing songs like God bless America. Well, live like it. I need a nation and I need some prophets. I need some prophetic people who will hate evil and love good. I need to hear my people crying loudly in the street, nonviolently, but crying out against what's happening. And if my people will do this, God says, then I'll make a visit. Could it be that, on, that only until the faithful stand with the oppressed in the public square but God says, if we'll stand up, then God will be with us. In other words, the rejected have to lead this nation to revival. The broken have to create the breakthroughs we need. And so I'm calling you tonight. I'm going to share it with Brother Salam. Hurt some, hope some of you will join this 40 days. It's 355 million, 400 million people in this country. If we can get 25,000. Dr. King only wanted 3,000. But if we can get 25,000 for 40 days to act in concert, Sir, to act in unity around an agenda that says we will not stand for systemic racism. We will not stand for systemic poverty. We will challenge ecological devastation. We will challenge the war economy and we will challenge any narrative that is a narrative of mean spiritness that does not respect the humanity and the imago dei of every human being. God says if we do God's will, he will use us to change the moral narrative of this nation and to help us together we will save the soul of America and the soul of this democracy. I'm calling you to render a moral challenge for the moral crisis that we face in America. Assalamu alaikum. I hope we will stand together.